Welcome to the PsyD webinar. I'm Bradley Seifer, and I'm the PsyD Admissions Advisor here at Divine Mercy University. The goal of today's session is to provide an overview of the doctoral program here at Divine Mercy University. So should you have any questions at any point during the presentation, please lodge your questions in the chat box, and I will be happy to field them at the end of the presentation. I've also listed my email as well as my Calendly link in the chat box. So please, um, I'd be happy to hear from you. Send me an email, register for a time to meet with me on Calendly, and I will very much I look forward to speaking with you. Now, before we get started, I would like to say a very um, quick, brief word about myself, um, explain sort of why I'm who I am, why I, and why I do what I do. So when I was an undergraduate, I studied history um, at the University of Mary Washington. And at first I you know, had plans on maybe going to law school and things like this. But as I became more immersed in my academics, I became more interested in um, actually philosophical and, and theological questions along with my you know, history studies. And after graduation, I um, was a teacher for a few years. Um, you know, I taught history, I taught Latin, I taught um, English, among other things, at a um, at a Catholic school. Um, and so that was enjoyable. But I, I, you know, I wanted to. I enjoyed teaching, but I wanted to teach at a higher level. And so um, I decided to go to graduate school, and I went to grad school in theology. Um, and I got degrees from Christendom College and Dominican House of Studies before um, going to Ave Maria University for my PhD in theology. Um, and while I was, you know, sort of immersed in my studies, um, I became increasingly interested with um, mental health because, you know, of issues that were going on in my own life and in lives of others I came to, that I loved and my friends and family. I saw that um, human flourishing concerned not just knowing what reality was and through the lens of philosophy and, and sacred theology, but also um, honoring the subjective nature of the human person. Um, and so what during my course of studies, when I was writing my dissertation, I decided to write about addiction. And so this was one of these um, integrative projects where I used the insights of philosophy, theology, and psychology. Um, and this is one of these, these, these projects that's very divine mercy, <laughs> as it were, as our school is very much committed to the integrative project between these three disciplines. And so as I learned more about Divine Mercy, I wanted to become a part of it. And so when the um, chance to come here and work um, emerged, I, I seized I seized it. And here I am before you today, um, as my passion is to get people like you into um, their dream career, into the mental health profession, as, as specifically as clinical psychologists, um, as I care very deeply about uh, the mental health of of our world and the role that faith plays in helping um, direct the psychological disciplines. Okay, so that's a little bit about me um, in a nutshell. Um, so without further ado, um, let's hop into the webinar for today where we're talking about the PsyD program at DMU. So Divine Mercy University is a Catholic graduate school of psychology. It was founded in 1999. At that point in time, we were known as the Institute of the Psychological Sciences. Um, and our, we expanded you know, since our founding. We included a counseling program at the master's level, um, as well as a psychology program also at the master's level and a program in spirit production. So we changed our name from Institute of the Psychological Sciences to Divine Mercy University to facilitate this growth. And that occurred in 2016. Okay, so in other words, we're one major university, we're one school, um, Divine Mercy University, but we have, um, I should say we were one university with two schools. So we have a school of counseling, um, which offers you know, a master's program, which is mostly online. Um, th there are episodic uh, residency requirements for our counseling students. So they, they come to campus from time to time. The Institute of the Psychological Sciences, we retained that name for our psychology programs, specifically um, for the doctoral program, which is residential on campus. And then we have a master's program that's on that's entirely online. There's it's non-clinical, it's an entirely non-residential um, online program. So our university's mission is to provide students with an effective academic and educational environment that supports the integration of the psychological sciences and a Catholic Christian understanding of the person through teaching and learning both knowledge and critical skills. Also to assist students intellectually and professionally as they prepare themselves to respond to their vocation 
as mental health professionals. We are located outside of the Washington DC area in the suburbs of Northern Virginia. So this is truly a wonderful area to live, to work and to study. Um, you have easy access to the city to enjoy all of the artistic and cultural opportunities that come with being near a major metropolitan area while also having easy access to um, a lot of beauty, a lot of beauty, a lot of natural beauty um, to the west um, part of Virginia, where the Appalachian Trail, for example, runs down the western part of the state. Um, or if you enjoy hiking, canoeing, camping, all of that is is also on access. So this is just a really a rich and and wonderful area to uh, go to graduate school. So we have a series of institutional accreditation um, of which we are quite proud. So we are institutionally accredited by SACS the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Um, SACS is recognized as an accreditation agency by the Department of Education, and Divine Mercy has voluntarily participated in this accreditation process. We met or exceeded all of the standards in thoroughgoing evaluation. Also, we've been approved to participate by SHEV, the State Council of Higher Education in Virginia, and the SIDE program has been recognized since 2006 as a national research designation program by the Association of State and Provisional Psychology Boards. And probably most notably of, of all is that we are um, accredited by the APA, the American Psychological Association, since 2016. And finally, uh, Divine Mercy has been approved to participate in, in the National Council for State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement. So as you can see, we have um, basically every accreditation um, relevant to our line of work. Now, um, when it comes to distinguishing clinical psychology from, say, getting a master's in counseling, for example, um, both types of clinicians, both at the master's and at the doctoral level, um, do wonderful work um, in terms of the clinical practice as a psychotherapist. But one key differentiating factor, among a few others, when it comes to becoming a clinical psychologist at the doctoral level, is the focus on testing. So the psychological assessments that come with getting a doctorate um, are very much part and parcel to our curriculum in the SIDI program at Divine Mercy. So you're going to get very well educated in the entire battery of psychological assessment um, from IQ testing or cognitive testing uh, to all the hosts of personality assessments, including the Rorschach uh, test, the MMPI, Big Five, among others. Okay, So that's sort of, you might say, the bread and butter um, of clinical psychology that you will encounter um, here at Divine Mercy. The doctoral program is a five-year program. It includes 122 credit hours, um, all told. It does also include a master's degree in passing on route to the doctorate degree. So in other words, after the first two years of successful coursework, you will be awarded a MSci degree. Um, that MSci is not a, in itself, a standalone degree to be a clinician, okay? So um, you know, God forbid, if you got into the program and you needed to leave after um, the master's, that would not, in fact, prepare you to become a clinician of, of any kind, um, because it's it's really meant to be part of the PsyD, and it's really kind of a, a, you might say, again, like a degree in passing on route to the, getting to the terminal doctorate. Now, I want to say a bit about the, specifically about the curriculum itself um, in the doctoral program. Um, so if you take a look at this slide here, you can see that there's a great deal of coursework involved, especially within the first two years, okay? The first two years, you know, I, I like to draw the analogy to medical school um, because there's so much, there's so much similarity. Um, for example, um, see how the coursework starts out rather dense, right? And there's lots of um, coursework. Then as you as you move through it, you can see how it diminishes somewhat, right? So the idea is that um, when you come here, you there's lots of psychology knowledge that you sort of imbibe and kind of get under your belt, as it were. Um, but then as you move through it, the clinical piece becomes a lot more important and prominent. Um, so you'll start to see patients um, beginning in your second year, You'll probably see a couple of patients, maybe two or three, um, we kind of ease you into it. And then by the third and the fourth year, you're probably seeing between seven and nine clients. And then finally, in your fifth year, um, this is where you go off to your internship. Much again, going back to the medical analogy, if you are a, re a medical student, you go to a residency. In psychology, you go to an internship. Okay, So you would, you would apply to a doctoral 
internship in your fourth year, hoping to get matched into that internship in the fifth year. Okay. Um, and these uh, can be all over the country, these internships, some of which are are local. Um, we've had a good many students in the past go to local um, internships and do very well. Many of them are APA accredited. Um, but many others go go all over the, the nation, um, depending on where you want to specialize in, um, regardless of whether it's a demographic focus in the case of work, wanting to work with children or adolescents, or if you wanted to say, you know, work with an elderly population um, or anything in the middle, you know, an adult um, population as well. Or if you wanted to do specialized um, studies in addiction or bipolar, schizophrenia, or whatever the pathology might be, um, typically there's a kind of an internship that suits those um, interests. Okay, on the academic side of things, there's a couple of things to see. Uh, the first is, is that this is a full year long uh, doctoral program, okay? Uh, you're going to be engaged in studies um, all year long, including in the summer. As you can see, you know, there are certainly um, summer courses in which you will become uh, engaged with as well as clinical duties that are ongoing during the summer months, okay? Um, typically students will pitch their dissertation proposal in the second year. So the goal is by the end of the second year that you submitted your proposal and it's been accepted by the faculty. And then another major milestone to point out is in the third year. So the idea here is that you take your comprehensive exams in the summer of year three and God willing you pass that and then provided that you've also passed the um, dissertation proposal, you're officially a candidate um, in psychology here at Divine Mercy University, a PsyD candidate. Okay, I think that's, we've said um, all that needs to be said with the, the curriculum. So, you know, if you have any questions about that, feel free to lodge a question in the, in the chat box, and I would be happy to talk about it later. Okay, a couple of questions of discernment, you know, is, is this right for you? You know, do you have a calling to become a clinical psychologist? So do you want to help people flourish? Are you interested in the science behind human psychology? Do you want to become an instrument of healing through the psychological sciences? Are you interested in performing a psychological assessment or test to diagnose your clients in a creative treatment plan? Are you looking to start a career as a licensed mental health professional and specifically as a clinical psychologist? And then finally, do you have the ability and desire to work with all types of clients for more acute care to more challenging long-term client cases? Okay, so we have a series of goals in our program that we do aim to inculcate in all of our students by the time that they graduate. And these are as follows. So um, foundations in psychological science and research, integrity and practice, assessment and diagnosis, therapeutic intervention, professional roles, and then clinical practice from a Catholic and integrative perspective. So I'm going to talk about all of these in a little bit more detail. Um, you might notice how the first um, several of them are quite common for you know a lot of PsyD programs that are also APA accredited. Um, the last though is quite peculiar to us, right? We're Catholic and we're very proud of that. Um, we integrate theology and philosophy um, into um, not just the courses that are specifically um, integrative studies courses, but also throughout the psychology curriculum, the questions of life's meaning and the bearing that that has on clinical practice is the very essence of what we do here at Divine Mercy University. So we're going to talk about each of these in turn. The first, foundations in psychological science and research. Graduates will attain foundational psychological science knowledge of biological, cognitive, affective, social, and developmental um, aspects of the human person, as well as history and systems of psychology, psychological measurement, research design, and statistical method. Graduates have the skills necessary to conduct their own psychological research. And Two, integrity and practice. Graduates be knowledgeable in the areas of diversity and ethics and display critical thinking, self-aware and reflective practice, and self-care. Graduates will demonstrate responsiveness to supervision, collegiality, and professional comportment in professional practice. Three, assessment and diagnosis. Graduates be able to conduct clinical interviewing, perform intake evaluation, demonstrate knowledge in the administration, scoring, and interpretation of psychological assessments, integrate multiple sources of test data and clinical interview information into written reports, diagnose, and develop a treatment plan. Four, therapeutic intervention. Graduates be able to demonstrate case conceptualization, excuse me, treatment planning, building, maintaining a therapeutic relationship, 
psychotherapy skills, crisis management, urgent special circumstances, and discharge planning. Five, professional roles, graduates be able to function in a variety of required roles of professional psychologists to include consultants, educator, supervisor, practice manager, and program evaluator. They'll be able to work collaboratively within the sort of teams and with clients. Six, clinical practice from a Catholic and integrative perspective. Graduates will build a Catholic understanding of human flourishing in an individual person in marriage and family life and be able to integrate this with psychological sciences in clinical practice. Okay, so as you might imagine, getting your doctorate will avail a great deal of opportunity to you. And this manifests itself in the different settings in which you might find yourself practicing as a clinical psychologist. And these are just a few among many. So working, for example, in a psychiatric hospital is a very common one. Um, in fact, one of our recent society graduates, Dr. Charles Russell himself works in a uh, psychiatric hospital. He works alongside um, an entire medical team comprised of physicians, so especially um, psychiatrists, those with MDs and DOs, um, and nurses, as, as he says, a whole gaggle of nurses. Um, but among other medical practitioners too, and you would be as the clinical psychologist on the team, you would be the mental health expert. In particular, um, as I mentioned before, should the patient need a psychological assessments or therapy, that would be your piece of the puzzle, right? So if there are other components that um, require healing of this person, uh, you know, certainly um, the other experts in the team would um, weigh in. But when it comes to the mental health piece, um, especially the non-pharmacological piece, that would be your domain, right? So when let's just say that the patient perhaps needed um, a psychiatric medication, right? Um, that would certainly be the domain of the psychiatrist, right? You know, the medical doctor. Um, but you as a psychologist, again, it's sort of like you're the, the testing and the therapy is sort of like where you shine. Also um, of, of notice um, is military establishments. Now, um, the military, of course, you know, has a great deal of money that they're now um, willing to spend on getting their people help treatments, um, especially with the very common phenomenon of PTSD and trauma that this, that's a lot of um, veterans. And, and a lot of these people need help. Um, and this is where, again, a Divine Mercy doctoral graduate um, could do very well indeed. Um, in fact, you, you when it comes to the fifth year, when you apply to that, some of the most lucrative um, internships are in within the military, say in the Veterans Affairs um, departments, um, simply because they're very well funded. And so this is an authentic interest for you. This can be a fantastic um, career uh, path for, for um, a Divine Mercy a doctorate a degree holder. Also, of course, you know, the, probably the most common one, though, is unsurprisingly um, working in private practice, right? You know, being able to go off on your own, have your own business, hang your, your shingle outside um, and see people on a, an entirely private basis. And you might, in fact, um, should you want to get into league with other clinicians, um, you know, either at the master's or at the doctoral level and, you know, expand that practice to be an association um, of other practitioners. Also very common is, you know, working either in an outpatient clinic or in a clinical facility, something like a addiction rehab uh, center, um, where you would, you know, be the doctoral level clinician um, amongst other clinicians, you know, again, at either the master's or the doctoral level. Um, and then this last one here, diocesan consultation. This is a huge one, especially for Divine Mercy graduates, because what will often happen is dioceses will have applicants um, apply to become seminarians, and a lot of these seminary applicants require testing. Um, and this testing is to ensure that these people um, have the sort of psychological um, makeup that would make them um, effective and good priests, good ministers um, of the church. And so again, like, this is one of these things that there's testing involved. And this is where the doctorates, the doctoral alumnus or alumna would shine because you have such a thoroughgoing uh, training and testing um, in, in all the different batteries of tests where you would be able to provide the needed um, evaluation. Okay. Now, we've had legions of students come through our school, and they've enjoyed a great deal of success um, in the world of psychology after graduation. And these are just a few of our alumni uh, from the PsyD program that have spoken to, the, to our program. 
Uh, so James Wallbitch has said, in our clinical psychology program, the training is focused on healing the whole person. Chris and Long, I was drawn to the SADI program as a desire to serve others in a more profound way than my previous positions offered. Timothy White, this school is not afraid to teach you what it means to be human at every level, psychologically, philosophically, and theologically, and that's why I like it. Kirsten Curtis, I'm so thankful for DMU. The faculty members are very supportive, yeah. and I receive lots of hands-on and clinical experience. Okay, this is a story of a current doctoral student with us. William Johnston um, is in our in our PsyD program, and he is speaking, as I was before, about the role that the military now has with funding um, psychological research, but also getting their people treatments. Um, he came from a military background, and he has developed a great deal of interest in trauma and PTSD. Um, so let's hear his story. Hi, my name is William Johnston, and I'm a PsyD student at Divine Mercy University, currently approaching the end of my third year in the program. Military service runs in my family, and um, and so both my grandparents served, my parents both served. This door, the PsyD program at Divine Mercy University opened the opportunity for me to continue to get back, to conduct research, and hopefully implement a more robust program to treat PTSD as it relates to combat veterans. DMU has certainly provided the integration that I've sought in terms of my formation, both the philosophy and theology for, in addition to the psychology curriculum, uh, has provided me growth in terms of my faith um, and my role as a husband and father, and of course, a psychological clinician. Um, so in essence, uh, the Catholic Christian meta model of the human person is, is why I'm here, both for my own sake, as well as the sake of my future clients. Okay, very good. So we do have another um, alumna story here. This one um, was a recently graduated from our Saudi program. So let's hear her story. I would say that being a student at DUI Mercy University or DMU is one of the best things that happens to me. I really appreciate a great support from faculty members and also classmates. I have gained a great deal of knowledge in all aspects of clinical practice, research, and also professional development. DMU not only provides students with strong academic skills, but also prepares them for a career in psychology. I personally benefit from mentorship with academic advisor and clinical supervisors. As a person, what I most appreciate from DMU is that its mission helped broaden my perspectives in understanding a human person through the lens of Catholicism, Catholic principle, especially in hope, love, and faith, are very valuable and certainly helped me become a better clinician. Okay, very good. Now, we offer a generalist program in psychology, which means that we don't have a particular focus, um, say, in one special area of psychology, such as forensics or forensic psychology or educational psychology, rather, we, our faculty have an expertise that spans the curriculum of psychology. So you're going to get coursework mm -hmm. in all the different fields from social, personality, adolescent and child psychology. Um, uh, in addition to all of the intense training um, within the, a clinical setting, so all the different clinical modalities um, from CBT um, to group therapy and marriage therapy and family therapy, DBT, EFT, internal family systems, the whole shebang, okay? Now, um, so I do wanna speak about a few of our faculty members here. Uh, Dr. Lisa Kolicki is our Dean. She's a specialist in assessment and therapy. Dr. Diane Graves is uh, the Assistant Program Director and she's a specialist in child and developmental psychology. Dr. Elena Oriana is our Director of Clinical Training. Um, you're bound to run into her, and especially in the second year when you um, begin your clinical work here on DMU. 
And the three gentlemen here at the bottom actually were among the founding faculty members from our school dating back to the late 90s. Uh, Dr. Scrifani is a specialist in CBT and group therapy, Dr. Nordling in child, marriage, and family. And Dr. Ritz's work really hinges at the intersection between theology, Catholic theology, and modern psychology. In fact, Dr. Ritz's own story um, is really part and parcel to the founding of Divine Mercy. In fact, as a young man, um, Dr. Ritz was an atheist, believe it or not. You know, he was... Um, he went to University of Michigan and majored in psychology and then went to graduate school at Stanford. Um, and this whole sort of period of time, he he lost his childhood faith, um, you know, in, in, in a way that many um, academics, you know, that in a way that secularism is sort of um, has a hegemony within the academy today, he became part of that sort of institutional thinking, you might say. Um, and then when he, you know, graduated with his doctorate, he got a job at New York University back in 1965. Um, and it was there that he met his now wife, um, Timmy Witz. Um, She was a professor of French at the time. And Timmy was actually, believe it or not, an even bigger, a bigger atheist than, than Paul was. Um, and so she was so uh, so much of an atheist that she actually got rid of all any reference to God in their wedding vows, believe it or not. Um, so they had a, sec a very secular beginning of their relationship. But um, what ended up happening is once Timmy became pregnant um, with their first child, um, Dr. Ravitz, Paul, you know, he had a little bit of a life, a, a quarter life crisis, you might say, um, because he thought to himself, well, I mean, what am I going to tell my my children about the meaning of life and why we're here? And are we really just sort of an amalgamation of, of, of atoms and, and we just where we live for a while and then we we pass out of existence and like that's all there is to it, you know, I have this kind of very materialist atheist kind of picture. Um, so this prompted a search and he wanted to know what was the meaning of life. And so he ended up reading a great deal. He read G.K. Chesterton and C.S. Lewis, among other uh, Christian and Catholic apologists. And at the end of the search, he came down to um, four different options, as, as it were. So the first option was um, basically careerism and a kind of almost like a kind of narcissism, really, you know, self-promotion, self-aggrandizement. Um, as a professor, there, uh, you know, he had plenty of opportunities to do that. Um, to make himself, you know, a big deal in the field. The second option would have been um, sort of new agey spirituality and Buddhism, things like that, um, which, you know, uh, was big at the time in the late 60s, early 70s. The third option was Marxist and leftist politics. So he had been involved in leftist politics um, from his days at Stanford, and he was, he was in California for, I think, eight years. And that was sort of his his gig for a while. And following the the dictates of Marx, you know, the idea that, you know, metaphysics is irrelevant and really philosophy should um, bring about social change. OK, so this was very much, you know, um, something that Dr. Bitz was already accustomed to. And then the final um, possibility was Christianity, Catholicism in particular. Um, and in a, in a final you know examination of all these options, uh, Vitz saw from, frankly, from the position of reason, that it was actually, you know, Christianity that made the most sense, uh, despite the cultural narrative to the contrary, that was very popular in the academy at the, at the time and still very much is to this day. And so what happened is he converted to Catholicism, um, as did his wife, and this, this happened over the course of the 1970s. And then he reached another problem, another sort of complication, you might say, in his life journey and his story, which was, okay, now that I'm Catholic and my wife is Catholic, what am I going to do in, in this very secular, you know, environment at NYU at the time um, in a very secular discipline, you know, psychology? And so this prompted a, yet another intellectual journey. It's like, so he examined the course of the 20th century humanistic psychologists, um, especially Abraham Maslow, um, Rogers, um, Eric Fromm, among other people. And he saw that a common denominator that, you know, sort of held them all together, as it were, was this concept of self-actualization. You know, the idea that, you know, the human person, the individual self is our own end. Um, and the, the meaning of life concerns 
basically fulfilling our own desires, you know, um, in living a rather self-absorbed existence. And uh, Witt saw that this was rather at odds with the gospel, you know, as Christ describes to us, because for Christ, it's sort of like for human life, what is the meaning of human life? It's really found in others, you know, in giving yourself to the other um, and of course, in God, the love of God and the love of others. And this stands athwart this kind of self-absorbed, narcissistic, um, you know, self-actualized kind of um, philosophy of the humanistic psychologists. And so Witt publishes this, um, what became known as a very seminal work, and it came out in 1977. It's called Psychology as Religion. I highly recommend it to you um, if you're interested in this. Um, and there, this caused a huge uh, kind of rippling effect in the psychological community. Um, many people really, really liked it and others didn't <laughs> at all for obvious reasons. But people that got wind of it, um, Dr. Strafani, Phil Strafani and uh, Bill Nordling, you know, were reading this at the time and they said, oh my gosh, like we got to get in touch with this guy. This is such a great, this is such a good idea. So these three got in league with each other and they said, oh, like, this is great. What are we going to do about it, though? So they decided to found a school that really kind of brought together Catholic theology, good, so solid, realist philosophy, and the best insights of modern psychology. And bringing this together, this would be a truly interesting, different, um, unique, but really powerful school that was unlike any other in many and in some respects. And so, the, sure enough, that's exactly what they did. And they got together in the 90s and they were planning. And finally, they came together in 99 and founded Divine Mercy University, then known as the Institute of Psychological Sciences. Okay. And then we've been growing ever since. I mean, that's sort of like the genesis of our, of our founding. Um, but the rest, as they say, is history. You know, we now have four wonderful programs. Um, the doctorate was the original, the OG, as they say, um, the, the, the first program that was with us from the beginning. And it's still the case today, our flagship um, doctoral program. So that's the, the story, the genesis of, you know, Divine Mercy University, which really originates with this great, this great man, Dr. Paul Vitz. Okay, so to bring things down to earth just a little bit, this is um, a bit about licensing. Uh, certainly to get licensed as a psychologist and as in many other similar professions, you know, in law or in medicine, you know, you get your doctoral degree and then you have to take the board exam to get, become an attorney like the bar or to, to get your, um, to become a physician to take the, the state and the national exams. The same is true um, to do psychology you finish your PsyD and then you're in, in a apprentice for about nine to 12 months. And then you take your, your um, state and national exams. And then you're a clinical psychologist, totally independent, licensed by the APA. Um, and there you have it. And you're off, you're off and running. Okay. These two charts depict a distinction that I like to draw. It can be helpful between buying something that's just rather material in case like a car is a great example. It's like the, the value of that is going to diminish rather rapidly by total contrast though, when you invest in education, I'm not just talking about any old education, but in cycle psycho in psychology, this is a field that is absolutely booming. Okay. This it's growing on a rate of 30% higher than um, basically the average profession in America. And that is because we are undergoing, we're in the midst of a mental health crisis. Um, the culture is sort of coming apart at the seams. We find so many people that are alone, they're isolated, they're addicted, they're depressed, they're without hope, frankly. And so for all of these reasons, this profession is on the up and up okay there's a ton of demand for therapists good therapists that are that have strong moorings in the catholic tradition and divine mercy is the par the paragon of that tradition and, and indeed so um what another thing to consider is that there's a huge demand for testing okay and the only people that can really do tests without supervision for the most part are psychologists that's like the, again as i said that's the bread and butter of psychology so this is another function of supply and demand there's a ton of demand and not that many not a whole lot of supply you stand to do incredibly well um as a clinical psychologist so it's very much an investment that pays um pays for itself you might say Okay, now the investment the, is 1,170 per credit for 122 credits 
over five years is 142740 uh, That does not include fees or indirect expenses, such as you know, housing, gas, food, things of this nature. Many of our students do get a federal aid, so the FAFSA will become available most likely um, this coming December for in this coming year. Um, and also we offer a number of ways of defraying, excuse me, defraying costs so that very seldom, if ever, does do our doctoral students pay this full sticker price. Most people are gonna get some sort of tuition uh, remission in the form of a, a number of things, um, including work study, scholarships, things like this, okay? So for example, in the, when it comes to work study, um, we offer that sort of throughout uh, the program on campus. In the first couple of years, it's, it's probably going to be jobs um, such as working with me and my colleagues in the admissions office or in the business office, say. Um, in year three and four, though, once you have your master's, you can become a teaching assistant and you can help the professors teach their classes, which can be very interesting, right? You're applying the psychology that you know that you know have. Um, and then we have a whole slew of scholarships to which you could apply, right? Um, this one in particular is um, apropos to all of you listening now because we are very early on in the, this is really sort of the first webinar of the admission cycle for 2024-2025. So provided that you get all of the elements of your um, application in prior to um, October 25th is the deadline, which I'll talk about in a minute, you're going to get 3000 off of your first year's tuition, okay? In addition, all of these other scholarships that you see listed here today are those that you would be able to apply to individually. And I certainly encourage you to take a look at our website, divinemercy.edu, and see which ones apply to you because there are um, certain things that are irrelevant to some and not to others, for example. We also offer merit scholarships. And these are our sort of like our top um, biggest money scholarships. They range from half off of tuition is our very best one and they go down to 25% off of tuition. And these are scholarships to which you don't specifically apply, but they're rather they're awarded to students based on, well, merit. Um, so the faculty will evaluate all of our applicants in the, all their respective interviews throughout the coming year. And then they'll dole out the top merit scholarships to the most deserving students. So um, you will only be eligible for for, for um, consideration for these scholarships if you apply early, though. So our last interview in March is is too late. But so that you're um, interested now, that you're hearing this now, is really going to be helpful because you're going to be able to get into an earlier interview and be considered for these top um, merit scholarships. In terms of entrance requirements, so what do you need to have to apply? Okay. All you need is a baccalaureate degree from any regionally accredited institution or school. Um, we, while it's true that we do prefer that you've studied psychology, and I think that could be very advantageous as you have already a, a good familiar with the field, in no way is that required. We've received many, yeah. many um, applicants and students that have matriculated in the past that have had no psychology background whatsoever and have done very, very well. Um, everything from the hard sciences and mathematics and physics to the arts and the humanities and, and the social sciences and everything in between. Okay. So we do need um, a minimum, a 3.0 GPA on a 4.0 scale. Um, now, if it's, you are um, in the position where your GPA is somewhat less than that, especially if it's like a 2.8, 2.9, um, don't despair. Um, I would encourage you to, again, reach out to me uh, via email or, or register a time in Calendly um, because it might not necessarily be a deal breaker, um, you know, provided that you're able to offer, you know, a compelling explanation as to, you know, what happened, why did, why was my GPA as low as it was. We can make exceptions. So um, if that's, if that's you and you're in that boat, let me know and, and we'll see how we can help you. Now, in terms of the application process, this is what, um, this is how it works. Okay, so if all this is making sense and you're convinced that this is for you, these are the next steps. The first thing is the online application, okay? And the online application is, um, as it suggests, it's, it's you can go to our website and you can find it online. It's a very easy kind of um, straightforward data entry kind of thing. A lot of it is basic um, facts about yourself, where you live, your email, your phone, things like this, where you went to school. And then toward the end of the application, it will ask you about who might be 
be able to recommend you to our program. Okay. Um, and there, um, all you need to do is put in the person's name, their phone number, and an email, and then you can submit. Notice, however, though, that this, once you do that, your recommenders will not be contacted. Okay. So you don't need to necessarily get their permission um, or anything like that. If you don't want to, you can simply put in their data and then you later can reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I'm applying to Divine Mercy's you know, doctoral program. Would you be able to recommend me? Okay. And then you would send them the link to the online portal to for them to submit online. It is an online process. It's not a letter a recommendation, which, you know, I can explain in more detail. Um, you know, it, should you want to, you know, proceed, and I can explain that uh, later on more. Okay, so the program does start then um, on August 18th of 2025. Okay, and this is this this slide is helpful because it gives you a nice sort of overview of the deadlines here. Like I said before, early admit scholarship deadline is October 25th, so that's where you get your 3,000 off of your first year's tuition. Um, and then, the, uh, so while the final application deadline isn't until um, February 21st, these are the interview dates. So these are the days that you would be coming to campus, on campus, on site to interview for the doctoral program. Okay. Now, like I said before, to be considered for a merit scholarship, you need to get into either the November interview or the January. The March, you will not be considered. Okay. Um, there's a lot of advantages, I think, to getting in early. Um, because you know this is sort of where um, historically we've we've handed out most of the merit scholarships. Okay, so there's a you know you know that will certainly work in your favor if you get in early. At the same time, this November interview is very very popular. Okay, so it is competitive. Um, I for that reason I highly highly recommend you know getting things done sooner rather than later so you're not excluded um, because this is gonna I'm telling you like this is gonna fill up quickly. And you don't want to get kind of, you know, sort of bumped to the next um, interview because it's very good to get into this guy. Okay, now, once the online application is submitted, what else do you have to do? Okay, so these are is as follows. You do need to write, compose two essays. Um, each of them are 500 words a piece, admissions essays, explaining why you want to study with Divine Mercy, um, what field of psychology might you want to research for your dissertation, um, and why you want to be a psychologist in general, okay? So they're very basic questions, um, two, two 500 word essays a piece, very easy. Um, and then updated resume, we'll need that as well, okay? Send that to us. And then, uh, as I was saying before, when it comes to recommendations, um, you want to make sure that your recommenders are either professors or a work supervisor. Okay, here's what we don't want. Okay, we don't want friends, family, spouses, um, therapists, nothing personal. So we want them to make sure that these are um, totally professional or academic in nature. Okay, again, if you have questions about that, let me know. Uh, we also will need, of course, official transcripts um, from your all of your post-secondary institutions. And then finally, the GRE. So the GRE is in fact required and there is no exceptions to this, regardless of how well educated you are. I mean, you could have a PhD, but you would still have to provide the GRE. I mean, so as long as you've taken the GRE in the past five years, um, that's that will suffice. So if you, if you took that um, even a few years ago, it still will work. If you've never taken the GRE or if your GRE is dated, you will have to take it again. Okay. However, and this is an important caveat, um, the GRE is hardly the most important part of the admissions process. So we're not looking for a perfect score by any means. Um, we're not, frankly, we're not, we don't even have a minimum score. Okay. So that should give you an idea. The more important thing is that you take the test and do your best. Okay. Because there are, as you can see from the slide, there's a whole lot of other things that are going to have to happen uh, for you to have your application com considered complete, right? Um, but the GRE is, is morally something that just needs to get done, okay? Um, it's, it's great if you do well, you know, that certainly will set you apart. But if you don't do well, please don't despair because um, I don't know if we've ever turned anyone away nearly on the grounds of having a low GRE. So that should, you know, be a point of consolation to many. 
Okay, if you are an international student, um, please know that you, you know, especially if your um, degree program that you, uh, degree that you have was not, uh, did not have an American GPA attached to it, it will have to get evaluated for an American GPA distillation. So I would go to either west.org or educationalperspectives.org, okay? And go to the website and then submit your, to them, submit your um, transcript for evaluation into uh, American parlance and then have that sent to us, okay? Um, the degree that you had from whatever the foreign country was needs to be the equivalent of American bachelor's degree, okay? Um, and that too needs to get sent to us. And if it's not in English, it must be, um, translated into English. And of course, this is, you know, this is your responsibility to um, make sure that that happens. And finally, and this is an important point, often misunderstood, which is um, if you're not a native English speaker, um, let's just say that, you know, you uh, converse mostly in a foreign language, like, you know, English is, is sort of not your primary language then you will have to take the TOEFL test, okay, to, to prove that, you know, you have a, a high level of English competency. However, if it's the case that, you know, you may have, let's just say your native language is Spanish, but, you know, you've been in America, you know, basically your whole life and you're used to English, you do most of your business and personal affairs in English, you would be considered a pri English as your primary language, even if it isn't your native, okay? Um, in which case you would not need to take the TOEFL. Okay, so if that if that is unclear to you, please let me know and I'd be happy to help you sort that out because that's an important point. Um, you can avoid, uh, you know, taking one other standard, standardized test if English is your primary language, the one that you, you know, do most of your affairs in, okay? Okay, that is all I have um, for everyone. I'm going to take a look at the chat box here and see what questions popped up. Okay, let's see, Q&A. That's right. Okay, Chris, um, please can someone be a clinical psychology where it doesn't have psychology background? Yes, so Chris, that, that's what I was saying earlier in that one slide, right? So even if you don't have a degree in psychology, like or any background, you can still apply to um, our doctoral program. So we've had you know, people from all different walks of life and all different disciplines apply. As long as you have a bachelor's degree, you can apply. Okay. Okay, Victor, is it possible to get most, if not all, of those scholarships? What are the conditions to acquire some or all of those scholarships? Okay, great question, Victor. So it's not possible to get like all of the scholarships. You can maximally apply to four of them and receive two of them. Okay, so there are there are limitations that come with that. Okay. Um, so if you have more questions about that, again, let me know. Okay, Juliana, what if you don't pass the comprehensive exam? What is the acceptance rate for PsyD at DMU and what is the lowest GPA typically accepted? Can we tour campus before we submit an early application in October? Okay, so I'll take the first one first. Um, if you don't pass the comprehensive exam, I believe you would probably be allowed to retake it, I think once, um, but I mean, that's pretty rare to fail, frankly, at the comprehensive exam um, because you're typically so very well prepared um, by the coursework and by the professors that by the time you get to that, you know, after basically three years of coursework, you know, you, there's a very high likelihood that you're, that you're going to pass. If you don't, then like, like there's something, there's something awry, but for the most part, people do pass. The acceptance rate for PsyD um, at DMU, Though, so those numbers when it comes to like acceptance rate, stuff like that, that's all on our website. If you go to um, divinemercy.edu um, and you go to data outcomes, so for PsyD, that's all listed there. And there you'll find all kinds of data from um, acceptance rate, attrition, retention, you know, graduation rates, things like that. Um, however, when it comes to acceptance, our acceptance is usually somewhere between 30 and 40%. On average per year, it depends on the year, but that's usually where it where it um, lies. And then, can we tour campus before um, we submit an early application? Um, 
the answer to that is maybe um it depends on a lot of factors you know scheduling things like that but if you're interested in a in a, in a visit um do let me know and we might be able to set that up so okay i think that covers it i think so good okay excellent everyone wonderful to have you um Again, let me know if other questions arise. I'd be happy to field them. Send me an email, bcipher at divinemercy.edu, and we can set up a time to meet. And I look forward to talking with all of you. Take care. God bless. Goodbye.